Hello, and welcome to the Humble Brag Podcast. I'm your host, Nate Mandel, and I'm joined today by my brother, Yuri. Yuri, thanks for joining on number three. This is going to be number three on the history of Zionism. It's a four-part series, or so we think at this point. Part one was the history of the development of Zionism. Part two was Jewish Zionism, or religious, re religious Zionism, right? Part three, this episode is... Probably um, the most complex one is this one. Secular Zionism. And then part four, so it's a little confusing between part three and part four, but part four may be something more along the lines of the history or current situation of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. According to Yuri, this is, this is the most complex one that we've done so far, only due to the history of it. There seems to be a lot of players involved in, in this time period that we want to cover. So it's a little bit of a challenge. How do you talk about so many players in one time period without repeating yourself and talking about the same events over and over? So we'll try our best to keep it organized. We're also recording outdoors. So there may be some, you know, forgive me for any background noise or whatever. Welcome to my sukkah. <laughs> We're recording on Chalamoit Sukkahs. So we're sitting in a beautiful sukkah in Lakewood era Kaidash. Uh, so let's get into this. Where do we want to begin? Well, we touched both times, obviously, on the person of Herzl. It's not possible to talk about Zionism in any capacity without speaking about Theodore Herzl. Because at the end of the day, with all the other names, and today you're going to hear a bunch of names. Last time we spoke about a bunch of names. He really is the guy. He's the man who got it done. Ideology aside, his religiosity aside, all of his faults and his, his ups and downs, he is the guy that got it done. The way secular Zionism is split up, because religious Zionism is really simple in a way. We spoke about it last time. It wasn't a long podcast because it's not complicated. Right. You believe in the Torah. You believe in God. Then you believe that the land of Israel belongs to the Jews. And the key players were a handful. A handful of people. Obviously, all Jews have it in them because we, we pray every day and we talk about the Shuv Chalitzion Barachmim and, and all these prayers and, and, and songs and kinnas and poetry about the return to Zion. But what is a secular Jew? What ideology is going to drive a secular Jew to believe in and fight for this ideal of Zionism? And there were many. And number one, there were many. Number two, they're the ones that got it done. As we spoke, we're going to repeat a little bit of what we spoke about last time. Chovah Zion and other groups, they couldn't get it done with big heads, people involved, Rav Kalisher, Rav al Kalai, the Nitziv, they couldn't do it. They couldn't facilitate it. Great ideas, great aspirations, but no execution. It's hard to execute. How do you take a group of, of people, a nation that's been tossed out and lost amongst all the nations of the world from end to end in every single country where there are human beings, there are Jews there, and from that, take them and recreate a country that is extinct since the year 70. Mind-blowing, the thought alone. The thought alone, it's, scary. it's a scary thought. So they're going to come up with ideas. Now, even when we say that they're going to come up with ideas, of the ideas that they come up with, all of it, almost all of it, were discussed and were spoken about. So... Herzl and Max Nordau and Wolfson discussing certain ideas on how to facilitate a Jewish state, a Jewish country. Rav Alkali spoke about that already. We spoke about that last time, about the spirit of the time enjoining us to go and appeal to the powers and to appeal to the empires and have them facilitate a country for us. So they he, he, he wrote that in... 1840, but they actually went and did it. So that first 
group, that first ideology of secular Zionism is going to be called political Zionism. They're going to use politics to get that country, to get that place. You're saying they're going to use politics to get what they want. To get what they want. Wow, sounds so outlandish. Not, <laughs> you know, it's a it's because no one does it's that. a phenomenon we're <laughs> very familiar with these days. Yep, use politics to get your way. And the reason we'll talk about them first is because Herzl's a political Zionist, and I would like to start off with him since um, he's really the person that got things going. No, nothing I'm saying is my own, obviously, it's things I've read, heard. Rabbi Beryl Wine speaks about a lot of this. Great book that I read was um, about Theodore Herzl by Dr. Weiss, a, a pretty new book. Um, so obviously all these ideas and, and, and thoughts are out there. I'm just going to repeat them over, over here. He's born in 1860 in Pest, which is today part of Budapest, but it's before the, the city became united. And he's born to a father who's already assimilated, but his grandfather was religious. And we mentioned a little bit last time that his grandfather davened in the shul of Rav Al-Kalai. So there is that little bit of a connection. And, it, and it's very possible growing up that he heard tidbits, little bits of, of this kind of talking about Zion and Israel and the need for this political Zionism, the, the way to get it done. But he wasn't busy with Zionism at all. Uh, he had a law degree. He wasn't a great orator. He was a, he was a great writer. And even though he had a law degree, he pursued journalism, writing op-eds, a playwright, linguistics. He, he liked that more. He lived in Vienna as an adult. Vienna is the center of, of all culture. That's the place under the Habsburgs the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And ultimately, he gets a job at a newspaper, which is called the New Free Press. Very influential, a big newspaper. And he works his way to the top. He's very successful. And he becomes the uh, editor-in-chief, which gave him a ton of power. Because as you can imagine, if the editor-in-chief of the Washington Post or the New York Times, you can imagine what kind of power they have. And if they have an agenda, yes. Or if they want to let the people know something, anything, correct. And it's used until today. Newspapers right. are used for that to wield power, but also it put him in a great position once he got started in his Zionistic endeavor to have connections to speak to pe very powerful people. Then it's Siv back in Velazhin has no power. Who's he going to talk to? He does. Herzl's in a good position once he becomes Zionistic. And as we spoke last time, that happens in Paris. He goes in the capacity as a, of a journalist of this newspaper. He has good power once he becomes editor-in-chief. Yes, because he's very well connected. He knows people. He knows leaders. He knows government people, military people. He's very, very well connected. And he uses, the, he uses it to his advantage. That's what he does later on, to meet people, to get into audiences. He was able to do that. In Paris, to cover the Dreyfus trial that we spoke about last time, is where Zionism turns on for him, clicks, the light bulb goes on, where he sees a Jew, he's going to cover the trial of Dreyfus, who we mentioned last time, the most assimilated Jew possible, the only Jew in the general staff of the French army. And since the French lost the Franco-Prussian war very badly, we got to blame someone. They blamed the Jew that he passed on information to the Germans. He's not loyal to France, even though his family's there for hundreds of years. They lived in, uh, in, in France for, for so many years and completely integrated into French society. So imagine Theodore Herzl there and Max Nordau, who's another person. So we'll, we're, we're going to insert Max Nordau a little bit now because they kind of, this is where they meet. This is where they come together. Who's Max Nordau? He's born Simcha Sudfeld to a Frum home. 
as opposed to Theodor Herzl. He's older than Herzl. He's born in 1849. His father's a rabbi. His father's religious, very religious, and a genius. His father had smicha, rabbinic ordination, from Rabbi Akiva Eger, who is one of the greatest poiskim until today, halachic decisors, one of the big geniuses of that time, of the early 1800s. He had smicha from the Chavez Das, who is also well known as the Nesivas, another great rabbi. So you can, you ima- you can imagine this being the father, but he didn't have a rabbinic job. He tutored. He tutored for, people would hire, back then it was very common that smart people, learned people would get jobs, tutoring the schools, chadarim, didn't exist to say, nowhere near like today, maybe for a couple of years, but most people, they would hire someone to come teach in the home. And that's what Max Nordo's father did, Rabbi Sutfeld. He's a real sleeper, like a secret genius, you know? Yeah. Smart, intellectual guy with yes. a ton of knowledge. He's hired by the rabbi of Prague to teach for, for his kids. You know who else was a private malamed, a private tutor? Moses Mendelssohn, <laughs> the, the so-called head beginner of the, enlight- the, the reform Judaism of Jews going down this path. So he was also a very ge- a big genius, learned, and he, that's what his job was also. So a lot of people, a lot of smart people had this job. Max Nordeau's father gets hired by the rabbi of Prague, whose name was um, Shlomo Rappaport. He's known as Shir, who's a son-in-law of the Ktsoy Sachoshen, also big genius in the, the, in the yeshiva world, halachic writer, Talmudic uh, commentator. Again, these, were, these, are, these are huge names to anyone in the, in the yeshiva world. That's the world he's born into, uh, Max Nordo. And he writes in his own memoir that he remembers learning, he remembers schooling, and his Talmudic studies and Gemara and all that stuff. He had bar mitzvah, he, which, which oppo- again, opposed to Her- Herzl had none of this. He had no background in Judaism. We don't even know if he was if he had a bris. Definitely not a bar mitzvah. Nothing. He kept his Jewish name though, Hertz. Call himself Herzl. Later on, he adds a name Binyamin. So, could be as his life went on that he was feeling stronger and stronger connected to Judaism and Jews. Max Nordo, on the other hand, gets rid of his name, Simcha Sudfeld. At 16, he throws everything away. Done, finished. He writes it was a bad memory, <laughs> his, his previous life, his Judaism. Wait, so you're saying going OTD is not a new phenomenon? <laughs> People were going OTD in the 1800s? Shocked. Jesus. <laughs> throws it all away. He becomes an agnostic, possibly atheist, but def- hates religion, all religion. Very smart, very sharp. He's coming from this home. Goes to Pest. Gets. I mean, he was born in Pest also, same as um, Herzl, older than him. Gets an education. He becomes a doctor. Gets a, a, a degree in medicine. Doesn't really practice too much. He's not known as a doctor. He was a linguist. He knew many languages, like his father. Seven, eight, nine languages. Fluent. And he, he moves on. He, he moves to Germany, then he moves to Paris. He lives most of his life in Paris. He's a phenomenal writer, writes a number of books, and he's a phenomenal orator, great speaker. And he's vitriolic, poison pen. He attacks everybody, all the thinkers of the time, all the philosophy of the time, the churches of the time, <laughs> the aristocracy. So you can imagine, he's lighting a fire under everyone, wherever he can, he's lighting fires. George Bernard Shaw, he attacks him. He writes a whole book back uh, defending himself. Emile Zola, very famous French lawyer who, 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 who defended Dreyfus later on. He, this is Nordeau. This is Max Nordeau. He's going after everyone. So how does he overlap with Herzl? He meets Herzl he, he was also there by the military tribunal of Dreyfus. And again, you have to remember, he changed his name. So he doesn't even, he's not coming across as a Jew. When he's attacking all these people, it's as him, as a thing. He attacks Nietzsche, the, the famous yeah. philosopher, until today, right? He, his philosophy is bad. Everything's bad. Marxism, it's all bad. Church is bad. Religion's bad. 
So you can imagine once he becomes identified as a as a Zionist, as a Jew, now they ha all have good reason to hate Zionism, all these influential people. And they did. They were all anti-Semites. Started off on the wrong foot. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but that's a fact. And that's what he was like. The story goes how they met, whether it's true or not, possibly. Herzl had like a dream. You know, they talk about Albert Einstein having these daytime um, thought experiments, he called them, where he would see a whole video play out of his ideas of what he was thinking. Herzl had a dream of uh, there while he's in Paris. He saw what happened. Max Nordau also saw that they're degrading Alfred Dreyfus. That's what they tore his medals off and embarrassed him. That was what they did. And then they sent them to jail. Devil's Island, I think it was called. The crowds are outside yelling death to the Jews. And they're bewildered by it because what do the Jews have to do with anything? Even if he's guilty, he's a Frenchman. He's an assimilated Frenchman. Why are you yelling death to the Jews? And this is, happen this is happening in Western Europe. It's not happening in, under Tsarist Russia or Ukraine. I mean, well, probably, Ukraine, Ukraine was part of Russia. Or Poland or some backwards country, right? This is happening in, in civilized society. It didn't make any sense to them. The irony. Oh, the irony. So they both see this. And it don't feel good, let me tell you. And it don't feel <laughs> good. And... He told a friend of his, I forget his friend's name, but Herzl tells his friend his idea that Jews have to go and, and they need a land of their own. They have to go to Israel. They have to go to Palestine. They have to Right, so this get is part out. of his epiphany, so he didn't say it's so part he, of his epiphany. he has this dream. He has Ruach HaKodesh. He right has, there, a, a prophecy. It, it, it's not even Ruach HaKodesh, it's prophecy. It's literally right. prophecy. So he has a dream, minus some, dream. Some, some intensity. Might have been a cat nap, but whatever. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> catnap. I this, had a dream. See, that's how Martin Luther King described his dream. Right. That's how he described no, it's it very as his common. dream. It's common. It's, uh, you have like a vision. Insight, a vision. Okay. okay. So he has this like epiphany that Jews need to go back and he tells who? He tells a friend. Friend says, you need a doctor. You need a psychologist. You need some therapy. And I know a guy, Dr. Nordo. Go, go, go. Because he dabbled in, also, he dabbled in like psychology oh, and other great. stuff. So he goes to him and he shares it with him, shares his vision. He says, And the doctor is supposed to, who's supposed to help. He says, if you're insane, I want to be insane with you. <laughs> oh, that's great. So these two are the pioneers of political Zionism, wow, if you want to say. It's a match made in heaven. That two very different types, very different personalities. But they worked together. He was loyal to Herzl because there was so much infighting. As Jew, again, as anything goes on, any anytime a party is built, it's always going to be. It's not possible for there not to be infighting. But he stayed loyal to him. Even when the British, I'll jump ahead a little bit, but when the British offered Uganda, people make it into the, that this was Herzl's idea. The people that are anti-Herzl, anti-Zionist, he would have taken Uganda. He offered at the, at the Zionist Congress, he, he, he put out the idea to accept Uganda as a country because the British gave it. The British were telling the Jews, you, you want a piece of land? You can't have Palestine. We'll give you here. Much bigger practice on it. And even Herzl said that. Like, we can learn over here. We don't know how to run a country. <laughs> how familiar does that sound? <laughs> we, we don't, right? Practice country first. And then somehow you'll, you'll go in a hundred years ago, you, you, then you'll go to Israel, build a country. So Herzl said, fine, I'll take it. Like, give me something, right? To him, it's the idea of, because because it's political Zionism, it's not built on Torah value, a value of Israel specifically. And Max Nordau didn't like that idea, and but he still voted for it. So he stood behind him because he because he because he stood behind them because he believed in him. Right, right. He believed in him, even though he didn't believe like in that this idea, particular idea. And it, you see it a few times. Herzl dies. Remember, last we spoke about nineteen oh four. Dies. He dies young. He did a few congresses. He was the the president of the Zionist uh, World Organization, and it happened a couple of times where people voted against their conscience to vote with him. You know who else voted for the Uganda pr proposition? Was the Mizrahi, 
the from Jews. You say, what? The from Jews? To them, it's like, what do you, it has to be Eretz Tzion Yerushalayim. That's Israel. That's Zionism. They put it aside and voted for it to stand with Herzl. There must have been something about him that was, that was very, you know, again, psychologically, there must have been something very powerful about him that he could get people to do that. So it also may have come across as a very practical idea. First, let's practice being a people, being together again, and then some kind of dream of going back to Israel. So, so you had the the, the, the purists, the people that wouldn't wouldn't accept any of this Chaim Weitzman and others. They said, "What? You crazy?" And they voted against it. They, it's, it's not possible. We're not going to Uganda. We want this. We want Israel. So he sp- he spent most of his life there in Paris, uh, Max Nordo, and he also worked for the New Free Press, the same uh, newspaper that Herzl uh, that worked in. And as we just mentioned, that it's it's that event that triggers both of them very negatively. Herzl, what he starts doing is after that, he starts after the Dreyfus affair, 1896, he starts lobbying government. He's going to put into action what he said we should do. We need a land. We, we talked about it. The idea is there. Let's go. Let's get to work. Palestine is under Turkish rule, the Ottoman Empire. He goes to Constantinople. He goes to the capital city of, uh, of, of the Turks, of the Ottoman Empire, and he wants to get a, an interview by the Sultan. He wants a meeting with him. He starts negotiating you have to smear a bunch of hands. It's not easy. It's not easy to get in. Why are they letting you in? He bribed. He spent a lot of money talking first to one guy and then the next guy. And as you go up, the costs get higher. He spent his own money. Never took a penny from any of the money raised from the Zionist organization. Never. Even though this is early on in it. So there really wasn't much money raised. And he's going to lobby. But what he didn't understand, one of the things that he didn't get, since he's a Western... Typically, he's a Western European. Whether you're Jewish or non-Jewish, you have a certain mindset. He had no clue about Islam and Muslims and all that. They don't want a non-Muslim community popping up in the Middle East next to them. This is um, this is Arab land. It's Muslim land. Once Muslims conquer land, it belongs to them. So he thought it was a matter of money, you know, bribing and giving some money. Just give us a piece of land. We'll start a community here. He didn't get it all. He didn't understand that. From the religious point of view, it can't stand. It's not possible. You're not get, you, you don't get it. So it never went anywhere. He tried really hard with them a long time. It, it really never went anywhere with the Turks. They would say yes, and then they would say no. Let's have a meeting, another meeting, and more money. And, and it never went anywhere. He was basically trying out everything Rav Al-Khali was said, wrote down earlier. Not necessarily that he knew he said it, or maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But he was in putting in practice what he said because he he wrote down in 1840. You have to try the French, you have to try the British, you have to, and he went through all the empires and governments. He lobbied and lobbied and lobbied. Meanwhile, he writes his book that we spoke about last time, Alt Neuland, Old New Land, Das Judenstaat, the Jewish State. Alt Neuland is really a, a fiction based upon the idea. You, das, das Judenstaat is the Jewish State, which is the thing itself. And he tries hard, tries hard, doesn't really get anywhere. So this is political Zionism. Um, he dies in 1904. They wanted to make Max Nordo the president after him of the World Zionist Organization. And he didn't want to. He wasn't interested. And David Wolfson became the, the next president. And he was very similar to both of them in his ideology for the state that we have to work with the powers that be to get a country basically they they want to come to them and say we'll take care of the jewish problem for you you have a jewish problem in 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 czarist russia you don't like jews in in the british empire give us a piece of land and we'll 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 help like we're we're helping you we're going to take care of the problem for you it seems like so much common sense but i could also see why Jews don't think that way, or at least didn't. Many didn't. Until now, when Jews are more political with Israel. Even American Jews, 
you know we know also we, we don't under, feel that we understand the significant we understand that we have to you know rub someone's back to get something done we get that concept now but i understand that maybe we didn't understand that concept when, when we were just sheeple in everyone else's place yeah because it is it's a very hard concept and even just to get to be able to speak to these people to speak to someone powerful enough in government jews didn't have these positions but remember what we said last time the spirit of the times because so much is changing and now you have jews in positions of power jews are wealthy there's lawyers doctors politicians that are jews suddenly you have access to people with immense power and ability to make this stuff happen but that itch that Herzl, Herzl really scratched the itch is Jews want to go back to Israel for so long it's an itch that's always there right that's what we spoke about the last both episodes it's an itch that won't leave so he's he's really started scratching it hard and showing that maybe there is a way at the 1897 first conference, the first Zionist Congress, it's called the Congress, Zionist Congress. He wants to make it in Vienna. He wants to make it in Berlin. He wants to make it in Paris. He wants to make it in a capital city, one of the hush of the European cities, one of the important cities. Nobody would rent them a hall. The non-Jews, they're not renting them a hall. He had to make it in Switzerland. Goes to Basel, rents a, a casino. That's where he makes it. And that's where the first Congress was. He says, Today we founded the Jewish state. It will take us 50 years to see it. <laughs> to the year. 1947 is when it became a state. The war, the war of independence, 47, 48. Wow. Quite incredible. Quite incredible. And he said that. I mean, he threw an estimate and... Uh... And happened to the year to yeah it's that's amazing so very very a very prescient person a very understanding person a, 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 a obviously a, you know a deep thinker a forward a forward-looking person very forward-looking you know that he sat and wrote down plans for piping water in israel pipelines top to bottom of the the country like he was very into it he only he he understood that it was a long-term game it was a long-term game and he knew it no instant gratification right right he lobbied the kaiser he went to speak to the Kaiser, the German Kaiser. These were this is before World War One. So again, there's a German Empire. He lobbies the German Kaiser, and again, also didn't go anywhere. World War One sticks its way. He dies, but World War One comes in in between all of this effort of Jews gaining an awareness of what's going on, and really throws a monkey wrench in. Because now, what do you do? Do you do you take sides? Which, whose side do you take? The Allies, the French and the British, and later the Americans or the, the, the Germans and the Turks who effectively control Pal where Palestine is. That's where a lot of the fighting started in between, between the Zionists themselves because some said yes, some said no. Max Nordau said no. Political Zionists didn't take a stance. You have to wait till the fighting's over and whoever's in charge now, that's who we're going to start talking to again. You know, we, 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 I want this one to win, that one to win. It's not, our, it's not our place to get involved. Politics. Politics. Hardcore politics. The other aspect of Zionism, of secular Zionism, were the cultural Zionists. These are the Achadaam, Eliezer ben Yehuda, intellectual Jews, not sophisticated, assimilated Euro Western European Jews. I'm talking about the cultural the intellectual Jews, the writers, writing in Yiddish, writing in Hebrew. Eliezer ben Yehuda already starts putting down Hebrew early on, before Herzl, the 1880s. Early on, he starts already developing the language of Hebrew, modern Hebrew that's spoken today. They feel, they come on board, not politically, they didn't even think that all the Jews should go to Israel. They felt that it should be an intellectual center for Jews in the world. Open universities... Hebrew University. Okay. Some very advanced ideas are born out of first simple ideas, and then they turn into these grand things, and that's what it seems basically happened here. Well, actually, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's a simple idea. I think it was actually a very 
deep, complex idea, very limited, if, if that's what you mean by small. No, well, we were talking about having like a cultural center in another country. It's very limited. <laughs> Compared to what we have now, which is very sophisticated. Yeah, yeah. But not all of what they wanted didn't happen. A lot of it did happen. The fact is, you have 7 million Jews speaking Hebrew in, in the state of Israel that none of them thought possible. Even Achad Am didn't think that was possible. He laughed at it. It's huge. He said, he said that's not going to happen. He said in 100 years, you're going to have a half a million Jews living in Israel. So they really thought it would be a small, hyper-intellectual place. Why does a Jew have to leave Vienna if he's a doctor and he's successful and he's doing well? He's not persecuted like the Eastern European Jew. Stay there. This place is for the intellectuals. Hebrew University that stands today, it was built then. This was Chaim Weitzman's dream. Even though he wasn't a cultural Zionist, we'll get, we'll get to him soon, at least we'll try to, another very complex human being. They built it in, I believe, 1924. And you know who was there when they, when they, when they started building it, the groundbreaking? Either at the groundbreaking or when they finished it, Rav Cook who we also mentioned many times. He was there, and guess what verse he spoke, when he, he spoke at the, at, the, uh, at the dedication of the Hebrew University, he said, Ki mitzion teitzei Torah udvar Hashem mi Yerushalayim. Because he understood why they wanted to build it. He was very understanding of, of, of everyone around him. He wasn't narrow-minded, he, he was very broad-minded. And he, <laughs> that's the verse he said, because he understood that this is what they, they want to project outward to the world, Jewish thinking, Jewish ideas. But that's what they were trying to do. Mechon Weizmann, the Weizmann, the Weizmann Institute in Rehovot, other places like that, cultural Jewish ideas. You have to remember this is a time. Think about the time. You have to keep placing ourselves in that time of Marxism. Karl Marx, right? He's alive, end of the 1800s. Out of that comes socialism and communism, right? Jews are at the forefront of a lot of this. They buy into all of this. If all of that didn't exist, Jordan Peterson would have nothing to talk about right now. <laughs> what would he talk about? <laughs> I mean, a lot, a lot came out of that era. A lot came out of it. Thinkers such as Nietzsche and others, and Jews are thinking, okay, we, we want to help end wars. We want to bring a utopia, a, a goodness, a, a betterment to the world, a, a economic availability for everyone. All the, This is what all these hyper-intellectual Jews are thinking of and writing of and speaking of back when speaking and writing had value as, 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 the, as, as an art. You know, Mark Twain is in that era. I'm just saying people like this. He's actually born in Skver, Skvira in Ukraine, uh, Achad Am. His name is Usher Ginsberg. He's born in 1856. Did not like religion. He came from a Hasidic family originally. It seems like that's such a good prerequisite. For it is. Because... It's phenomenal. We see a pattern. You see a pattern. You see a pattern. They almost seem to say that religion is the problem for everything. Because these are intellectual people looking for solutions for the world's problems. And they very often then, and even today, like to listen to Sam Harris. What does he say the problems in the world are? Religion. People believing foolishness. Mm. 120 years ago, Achadam is saying it, and many of Max Nordo and a lot of these people, they, they say, hurt, you know, they, they believed religion is, is the root of many, many problems. Marx said it, Nietzsche, a lot of them. He worked at Vysotsky T famous tea company that's still alive today that's what he did that's what his job he was a clerk there i think he was a clerk or some sort of secretary but he was a phenomenal writer and he wrote in hebrew he was a huge proponent of hebrew that people should know hebrew and he disagreed very very strongly with uh theodor herzl and max nordo he didn't believe in political zionism he didn't think that they should be running to britain he's like we don't want to run a country <laughs> We want to be in charge of garbage pickup and then building buildings and manual labor. We're thinkers. We want to sit in Hebrew University and kind of think of ideas and give it out to the world. That's literally how he thought. And others too, Chaim Nachman Bialik, uh, who was a Velazhina yeshiva boy, went secular and uh, 
was also involved in Hebrew and in other cultural phenomena like that. So these, these were cultural Zionists. A Jewish state, not merely a state of Jews, which is what it is today. So far, we've already, we've already covered two types of non-religious or secular Zionists. Of how they view... Non-religious Jews. The utilitarianism of Zionism. Yeah. We need something, but we need it for this reason or that reason, but they all need the same thing, which is a state. But not necessarily for nationalism. They, they, Chad Am doesn't believe in nationalism. So within secular Zionism, just on these two types alone, we already see a breakaway of two types of opinions. And this is within secular Zionism. Yes. And so as we continue to move down, it gets even more, there's more layers to it. Because the next, the next category is actually going to be the, the one that brings the state to fruition. Because the other two, whether you, want, whether you think they're good ideas or bad ideas, they kind of got it going, right? With Herzl and Nordau and, and um, people like Achada Am who, who, who are bringing back the language and, a, and, a, and a, like a little fire going on within the writing. Achada Am is not just writing, he's writing pamphlets and, and booklets. So people are starting to speak Hebrew and there's groups coming together and, and all that kind of stuff. So there is things happening, right? There are things happening. And this is, this is outside of our chapter, too. This is outside of, of the Com religious world. Completely separate. Right. Because the religious Jews are not on board at all. They're not on board. Even though you had prior... We'll, we'll, we'll jump back like 30 years. You have a man, Leo Pinsker, who writes a book called Auto-Emancipation on the idea of Jews emancipating themselves not waiting around to receive emancipation from our benefactors, so to speak, the Russian government or the, the Austrian government. No, emancipate yourself. Pick yourself up and go do something. He was a secular Jew. He was friends with the Nitziv. He was friends with the Chovevei Tzion. Chovevei Tzion was like a mix of, of different types. But all of what we're talking about has no involvement with religious Zionism whatsoever other than the Mizrahi being part of the, the Congress. Yeah, we, we spoke about all of the religious side of things. It's fascinating to think that so much movement, <laughs> so going many on thoughts and disagreements and at ideology the same time. in that circle. And then the other circle is completely other ones. And there's so many, so many things happening at once. Quite incredible. And, and, it's, it, and again, we spoke last time also how it had to be this time. It couldn't be earlier. It had to come with emancipation. It had to come with ideas of nationalism that were coming out at that time that we spoke about last time. Many little countries breaking away from colonial, you know, big superpowers. Timing was superb. Superb. It had to be then the church losing its power. The church was very anti-Zionist because the church, the Catholic church, can't allow for Zionism. They don't believe Jews have any claim to the land of Israel and, and, and all that. Other than today, the newer, you know, the, the, the Protestants who do support Israel big time today, they do believe that the land has to go back to the Jews before the messianic uh, ideal can come and happen. That's their belief. But the Catholic Church did not believe that. So as they're losing their grip on the people because of emancipation and enlightenment, this also allows for the Jews, because they, they were in charge of countries. The kings were religious puppets by the church, to an effect. Obviously, it's more complicated than that, but as they're losing their power, things Jews can rise up. People can travel. There's steamships. There are trains. Suddenly, the world's smaller. It's getting smaller and smaller. Today, we see how small the world is today, how we can get around and communicate so easily. But imagine then, you went from... 1700, where you couldn't get anywhere, picture Rabbi Nachman traveling to, to Israel or the Baal Shem Tov takes months, months and months. Then suddenly in 1880, you can hop on a train, travel across Europe in, a, in, in four days, get on a steamship, you're in Israel in a week. Yeah, concepts start becoming realities. Exactly. So things that people just dreamt of until then, Ideas suddenly you and can fantasies do it. fantasies you could put your hands on, you could touch. And that is what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. So uh, the last part, obviously, both of those, you can go on and on and on more and more and more. 
but we just want to give a, a feeling and people can obviously research and look it up and you know educate themselves more on this on this topic practical zionism that's the third category the reason i'm leaving it for last i said number one i wanted to start with herzl number three is because this category breaks down into many subcategories from it because here's where the country really starts coming together jews start moving to israel in the early 1900s bigger numbers now jews are really running away from russia three million come to america not only to america but the vast majority came to america where the where we come from that's our background that's where millions of american jews came from about three million jews left eastern europe many went to england other european countries ireland south africa but the vast majority came to america lower east side new york that's where american jewry was was again it took a good 30 40 years for that to happen but over those years baltimore <laughs> yeah yeah all, all of them so as that's going on, Jews are, are also going to Israel. The Jews are picking up and they're opening kibbutzim and they're opening, you know, um, this little town starting, Petach Tikva, and then a little, little bit of Tel Aviv. And things are happening. Things are getting built. This is what the practical Zionists believed. Don't go fetching to, to, to England and to the, to, the, and to the Germans, the Kaiser. Just and move, plant some pick seeds. Pick yourself up, open a kibbutz. Right. Practical. Go ahead and do it. Mass immigration. Jews should start pouring into Israel. It's ironic, but you actually need a mixture of both. It's both. That you need brought all it about. of this. That's what you're seeing. In retrospect. In it's retrospect. It's easy need... to see that. Exactly. And it was the cause for a lot of fights, a lot of arguments, a lot of screaming, a lot of yelling, a lot of, you know, a lot of disagreement and enmity and, and just a lot of bad blood. But it you needed all three. You needed all three. Because even Chaim Weizmann, who we're going to talk about now, who came from a traditional home, 15 children, big family, Eastern European. The more Eastern European, usually, they had more of a, a gefil, a feeling towards Israel. Because they tended to come from more traditional homes, more religious homes. Even a person like David Ben-Gurion or Jabotinsky, and these were Eastern European Jews. Chaim Weizmann, Eastern Europeans. Even if they were atheists or didn't believe in God or the religion or all that stuff, they still had a, 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 a strong feeling towards Eretz Yehud of Yerushalayim. They had, they had a much more than the Western secular Jews, the Western European secular Jews. They, again, it, it was in the blood. It was, it was much stronger and deeper, deeper ingrained. Yitzhak Ben Tzvi, he was a friend of David Ben Gurion. We'll touch on Weitzman a little bit. His name was Chaim Weitzman and came from a traditional home. He left his home early. He was a, he, a very brilliant boy. And he also became a Zionist early on at a young age. And he, he's considered the, 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 again, not the founder. No one's a founder. These are ideas of practical Zionism. And this is what he pushed for. But at the same time, he's a socialist. <laughs> He believes in all the all the new Russian revolutionary ideas that's coming out, you know, from Karl Marx and all that. He disagrees with Herzl. There's disagreements, and he rises to the ranks as an important Zionist. He moved to England. He lived in London. He lived in Manchester, and he would lobby. So, so you're seeing, even though he's a practical Zionist, he understands the power of lobbying the people in charge, because once Palestine. Again, World War One comes in. There's fighting between the Turks and the Allies. The, the, the British, the Turks are going to lose. He's fighting hard for the British to grant and recognize that the Jews deserve a piece of land in Palestine. And he fought hard. And it's probably to his credit, not probably, but most certainly to his credit, the Balfour Declaration in 1917 that basically said the Jews are going to get a piece of this land. That was the opening to formal recognition that the Jews are getting a piece of Eretz Yisrael. And that, that's through Chaim Weitzman. He met Balfour. Balfour came to Manchester, I believe, and he, uh, he asked Chaim Weitzman to come over to see him. And he went to see him and they had a meeting. 
And he's lobbying him hard. He's telling him how the Jews really need, we need it. And he was telling him, well, but what about the Uganda? We offered you guys Uganda. How come you don't want to take? Because remember, they offered, they offered it to Herzl. So he tells him, imagine if we offered you, instead of London, we offer you Paris. Would you take it? Right, it's a big insult to a Britisher. Like, well, he said, no, of course not. But he says, the difference is, we already have London. You don't have Yerushalayim. So Chaim Weitzman tells him, but my ancestors were kings in Jerusalem while London was still a marsh 3,000 years ago. And he was very impressed by him. And they, they created like a friendship. He so liked his wits. He liked his wit. He liked his comeback. There's a story that he um, he was a chemist. He was a trained uh, um, chemist, uh, a scientist. And he developed for the British, at the end of the war here, you're talking about artillery shells by the millions, millions being fired, both from the Germans to the, to the French and British. You can't understand. I mean, you listen to, you read or watch or whatever, the history of World War I, read about Verdun, what was going on a day. Hundreds of thousands of artillery shells, both sides, daily, daily. Not normal numbers uh, along the trenches of, of, of World War I. He developed an acetone to increase um, production and gave it to the British. And they appreciated it. And he, I think also the, the Balfour asked them, you know, like, we, what can we reward? We want to reward you, money or something. And he said, all I want is a homeland for my people. So that's, an, that's what another story. Max Nordeaux said that story never happened. He didn't <laughs> like it. <him. laughs> he didn't like <laughs> He came out and says uh, the story's not true. <laughs> Typical. Yeah, he was antinomian. He didn't like, you know, don't get, don't tell me Baba Mises about this, that. You created a something. So typical for, what it is. You don't like something, never happened. It didn't happen. Every story, yeah. The, yeah Chaim Weitzman never that. never said that it did, but he allowed it to be said about him. He he allowed the story to go out. He, he enjoyed it. Officially, that's a story. Uh, officially, who knows how true, but maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. The other story is true, where um, it's because it's recorded from both sides that he told that to Balfour about his ancestors being in Jerusalem when his were running around naked in the uh, you know barbarians in the, the British countryside. And Chaim Weitzman, it didn't end there. He, um, I think, 1925, he's elected the, the the president of the World Zionist Organization. He's a socialist. What are the socialists? One of these a practicals. What's a practical Zionist? They feel that this is a way that they can fulfill this Marxist socialist ideal to the best. Here's an empty country. To them, it was empty. The, the few Arabs, they didn't mean anything. To them, it's a, a clean slate. Here we are. We have a place. Let's open up kibbutzim. That's what the kibbutzim were. It's a forerunner in their mind to future world uh, communism. Here's a place that we can do it. This is a place that we can all get along and everyone's going to share everything equally and beautifully and we'll all, we'll all, get, we'll all be happy. A real utopia. Utopia, baby. David Ben-Gurion, another. He's born in Eastern Europe. His name is David Grun. That's his, his, his original name. He changes it later on to Ben-Gurion. He's a hard-headed, he's a pit bull. He's, he's smart, he's, he's, he's well-spoken. Doesn't like religion either, never did his whole life. His, he just didn't. He got married in New York. He, 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 these guys traveled a lot. They would travel to America, to Europe. They constantly lobbying and working the cause. They were working a cause, but they, they used to travel around. He, um, he bragged how he, he got married to his wife in New York and, and, and bragged that he never got a, 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 a rabbinic wedding, a, a kosher wedding, only a, a civil wedding. So these are, these are the type of people they were, but they, they had a burn in them for Israel, for again, for whatever reason, practical reasons, cultural reasons, simple anti-Semitism. You have a guy like Jabotinsky, Zev Jabotinsky. He's another guy who falls under practical Zionism because he actually felt that Jews should fight for it. Pick up sticks and rocks and fight for it. He believed anti-Semitism is a disease is what he said, I think. It's a disease that no Jewish doctor can cure. <laughs> it has that, to be fought by hands and He feet. says, you have to fight back. It's not going to cure. It's not going to go away. Yeah. 
pick up a stick and fight. And he actually did. He would organize groups to fight. And this is a phenomenon. What? For 1,600 years, you're sitting around. Jews don't fight back. He says Jews do fight back. That's Zev Jabotinsky. For World War I, he arranged for a Jewish fighting unit to fight with the British. He did take a side. The political Zionists are saying, no, let's stay out of it. Let's see who wins the war. He says, no, let's help the British. Let's get them out. We'll have a better chance with the British to get a land than the Turks. And he did. He organized a Jewish fighting unit. He wanted to call it Hagdud Hatzioni, the Zionist Brigade. Max Nordau reaches out. He says, no, 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 don't, don't call it that. Call it the, uh, the Hagdud HaYehudi, because he didn't want Zionism to be affiliated with fighting against one side or the other. This is how everything to them was uh, calculated and po- political. And, and he ends up calling it Hagdud HaIvri, the Hebrew Brigade. There was the Jewish mule uh, brigade that the British inducted and set up to fight in Gallipoli, which was a a terrible blunder for the British. It ended up being a nine-month slaughter of British soldiers against the Turks. A disaster, but Jews were involved. They were like the schleppers. They called them the mule brigade because they they would like haul the artillery and, and stuff. The reason Zev Jabotinsky felt... He, he felt it was a really good idea to put together a Jewish fighting unit because then you don't dis, disband them after the war. They become the new, the, the new army for the, for the Jewish go in and then kick the British out of, out of Palestine. You have, a, you have a trained army. Yeah, that was smart. It's interesting to see how the thinking, how the thinking changed by introducing political Zionism into the Jewish world into that ecosystem. Now it's very second nature to us, but because it exists and we're used yeah. to it. But it's interesting how it changed Imagine the way in a we. Time when Jews didn't have anything, yeah. we were we were the sheep. More than a thousand years, that type of thinking didn't exist. Didn't exist. And suddenly you have people like this coming in and and talking big, like oh. And we, once it's here, now everyone has an opinion. <laughs> and, and, and now fight it's this way. Now fight it's as that if way. we've been doing it, <laughs> as if we've been <laughs> for political, two thousand yeah, years. Yeah. <laughs> Do you realize how new it is? It's so new. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's so new. So Ben-Gurion is actually under practical Zionism because that's where he falls under along, you know, with Weitzman and he doesn't like... So Ben-Gurion is this youngster. He's a full-on Zionist by 14, 15 years old. He's traveling already. He's, he goes to Eretz Yisrael, like I think in 1905, early on. And he's working, but he's a, he's a total communist, total he was arrested. He was arrested. All these guys were arrested by the czar and then put in jail and they come out. And again, he feels full on. He's, he's the head of the Histadrut that comes from the, the Bund. The Jewish Bund is the biggest labor union in Europe. The biggest labor union. Everything's about the worker. The worker, the worker, the worker, the workers need rights, the workers need this, the workers need that. They need, uh, you know, all the things that we take for granted now, but that's what communism and socialism was. Fairness, equality across the board. He had a terrible degree of vengeance, of stubbornness, which again, it can be a curse, it can be a, it can be a blessing, because you, especially for those times and that place and in, in this era, you needed to be terribly stubborn to get anywhere and get anything done because everything took forever. But he remembered every person that ever did anything wrong to him, said anything to him for life. <laughs> he did not forget. A lot of people have a, you know, the black book and a white book. He only had the black book. Oh, oh, David Ben-Gurion, incredible. Great memory. The Russian, he came to the Russians to try to work with them. He says, we should build this place together. We're all communists. We're all in this together. Yeah, they said, no, we don't, what do we need? We don't need a bunch of Jews over there. And later on, when he's the first prime minister of Israel in 1950, the Russians come, you know, oh, influence. The, the U.S. wants to influence Israel. The Russians want to influence Israel the same way they did to all the Arab countries. He went with the uh, U.S. because he remembered. Thank God. Can you imagine had they gone along with the Soviet Union? Israel's a whole different country today because it aligned itself with the West and and America and the European countries. But that's that's who he was. He felt that way about Chaim Weitzman. With all the work Chaim Weitzman put in, Chaim Weitzman lobbied Harry Truman 
Like he never said he's talking about for 50 years. He's lobbying and talking and traveling and working and working and working for the state, for the barely state. Right before the vote in the UN, when they need every last person, he goes down to Washington, D.C. Truman didn't want to see anyone. He didn't want to see any Zionists. He didn't want to meet any Zionists. He wasn't going to be swayed in his vote for or against Israel. There was a vote. And they ended up getting Eddie Jacobs, who was an old uh, partner in Truman's haberdashery store. He had a clothes store back in Missouri when before he was a president. Jewish partner, and he liked him. They got him to go, and he went, and he spoke to, to Truman, and he begged him. Mamish like a story like Esther. Esther Amalka, she comes to the king to beg for her people. And he, he's, who knows how he cursed or whatever he said. This is, you know, Missouri's country boy that Truman was, but he agreed. He's going to, he says, I have an old, tired old Jew who wants to meet you. That's what he told him about Chaim Weitzman. I have a, there's a, I have a tired old Jew. Please meet him. And he met him and he spoke to him and he must have impressed him the way he impressed the British and many others. He must have been a very impressive person. And Truman voted for the state of Israel. And... Chaim Weitzman was, they offered him to be the first president of Israel after the establishment of the state. He thought a president's like the United States is a president. So he took it. He didn't realize that the president's a non-job. Yeah. <laughs> and he was pretty broken up. His son dying in the RAF, his son fought for the British in, in World War II. He was shot down. That hurt him, that like broke him a lot. And he died I think a heart attack while he was president, and that was the end of his. And while he's president, and Ben Gurion is the prime minister, he, he kept him out of the loop completely. He wouldn't share anything with him. He didn't let him in on meetings. <laughs> he wouldn't let him read any papers, government papers. Again, he never. If he, if he felt he didn't like you thirty years ago, you were done. <laughs> He understood that he has to, you know, he's got to make him president because he was so instrumental in, in, in the make, creating the state. But he kept him at it and, and he spent his time doing stuff that he loved. He was in Rehovot. The reason Rehovot is such a big city today is because of Chaim Weizmann, Machon Weizmann, which is the, the Technik Institute. And he's buried there. He's buried in the back of, he wanted to be buried right behind his house in Rehovot. Him and his wife, they're buried right in their yard. And at the end of his life, he became more religious. He started davening every day, stuff like that. He felt uh, a, a, a deeper, closer connection to religion. Ben-Gurion himself, very, very complex person, and always got his way. And when you always get your way, it, uh, you know, again, you start thinking you're always right. <laughs> it just becomes a psychological phenomenon. If it's always going my way, then I must be right. Well, yeah, either that or you scare people and they, you know, they, no one can stand up to you. Yeah, I don't think you're born a narcissist. <laughs> you know what I mean? It kind, of, it kind of happens with time. But it takes a certain type of person to do these things. So with all their faults, you know, he's a leftist. And, and he was. He was a leftist. He was a labor. He created the labor union in Israel, Avodah, which is a, a government party till today. That's Ben-Gurion's party communist, socialist. He was very practical, though, in the terms that when he saw something doesn't work, he would change. He didn't just keep going the same thing. Doesn't work, we, then we're going to change and we'll make it work a different way. Look, he's a founding father of the state of Israel. Um, he's a leftist. Uh, he's a practical Zionist. The Zev Jabotinsky, the fighter type, who started the underground to fight the British after running around Europe for, for 30 years telling the Jews to move to Palestine, He's called a revisionist Zionist because he it was a revisionism on practical Zionism. So, like I said, in practical Zionism, there's break off groups, subcategories, on down, on down. And I think it would go on down all the way till today. For sure. That character to, to be able to change and pivot as needed is actually a very strong characteristic in, in any type right. of founder. We know that now in, in modern business how important it is, but... You know, the ability to do that will basically speak of the outcome. It'll Correct. determine the outcome. Because those who don't, don't win. Right. That you don't end up with a, with a desired outcome. Right. So that's actually really interesting. So, so we, you covered a lot about the key players. So I'm wondering also about 
the masses themselves. So if we start, if Good we look question. back, if we look back at you know our first episode and then our second episode. So the first episode is more of the long term history, and then we spoke about religious Zionism. So we have the key players are these rabbis and these influencers, and we know behind them are all of these uh, Hasidim, all of these followers. So if person A Correct. or B is... If so you're saying who's, is, who's following uh, Herzl? Who's following Weitzman? Who's yeah, the, because we know why religious Jews, because we're religious, so we know why we want to live in Israel. How about the peasantry of the secular Jews? So we learned about the, the key players in the secular world, and but for the masses of the secular, and by the way, there are a majority, right? There are more secular than there are religious, and there always was, I believe. Yeah. Unless, I don't know, in the early 1900s, but I believe there always was more non-religious than religious, and still today. Yeah, it's since, since the immigration started. Essentially, it was, it was what's going through their mind, because it seems very practical. They're Jewish. They want a country. Some were even ready to go to Uganda, as we discussed. But Israel came, and, and that worked out fine. So it just seems very practical. What's the big ideology behind it? Just cultural people? I, I think, well... Again, you'll have to break it down, pre-creation of the state to after creation of the state. I think pre-creation of the state, I think you had people of all these denominations, people that believed in every single one of these things that these leaders put forward. Some people wanted to fight, some people for utilitarian reasons, some people to get away from anti-Semitism, some people for cultural reasons, and other people for practical reasons, simple to go kibbutz. I think a huge number were the last type, socialist, huge number. Eastern European Jews, tons of them were, like I said, the Bund, which was the labor union for the Jews in Europe, was the biggest labor union in Europe, the largest. So... That means so many Jews signed on to that. So I, I think it's it's all of the above. Where it gets complicated is afterwards. You're born into the state of Israel, and you're not religious, and you, you, you don't even know who David Ben-Gurion was. As we know, you ask an American kid who George Washington was, they don't either know. Even though there, it's so close to history, it's such a shame that they don't know. But they, if they're not going to know who Avram Avinu was, why should they know who David Ben-Gurion is? Look, once you're born into it, I understand you don't necessarily even need the. You home. don't even need an idea. Yeah. You, you're born in Rehovot. Yeah. This is where you live. You're born in 1980 and finished. You're you're an Israeli. It comes with education. It comes with knowing what's what's going on. Yeah, I was more asking um, the people who came over. So so it's a mixture. Fine, a lot more practical. But also, it's I values think a lot more practical. Ideology. The early years between before World War One, after World War One, you have to remember. When the Red Army overthrew the Tsar of Russia, do you realize there are 10 million Eastern European Jews? Huge number. Huge. That's with the 3 million that went out, that came to America and other places. They went on a rampage. The White Russians and the Red Russians, they were fighting each other, and they were killing Jews. A quarter of a million Jews were killed in the early 1920s. We don't even know about it because it's so overshadowed by World War II, by the Holocaust. But so many Jews were killed, entire communities wiped out, killed, raped, murdered, all, all, all the kind of horror. Yeah, there were certainly a lot of practical reasons to go. But to move to Israel because, for example, safety and security, because you know you're persecuted and you're being killed and anti-Semitism is very different than somebody who moves because they have a love for the land or they believe that they belong there or that God gave them the land Correct. and they belong there. Right? These are very different ideologies. And it wasn't so possible either because the British instituted a white paper, which was a restriction on you had to have a white paper to, to emigrate to Palestine. So there was a restriction on Jews moving there because the Arab, British were getting sick of it. The fighting going on, there was a riot. You know, There, there were constant riots by the Arabs against Jews. There were riots as Jews were coming and communities are being built in 1920 and then 1923 and 26 and 29. The Hebron community, the yeshiva was murdered and then throughout the 30s. So the British had to keep sending more troops there and more troops there to protect because they won the land after you know World War I. They basically took over the land. They had to, to protect the communities there. They had to keep sending soldiers and they were sick of it. They didn't like it. So they put restrictions on immigration. 
So that just simply made it hard to, for any for any Jews to come in. So from th- that whole in between period, 1920, 1930, not many Jews were able to even come to Israel. Those who were there were there. Communities were there. Jews were sneaking in, but not until after World War II, with a mass immigration of Jews, refugees leaving Europe, to the, the 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 few survivors of the Holocaust where the numbers went up to over 600,000, like we said last time, and that allowed for the state to come into being, to survive, even survive an Arabic war. How are you going to survive an Arab war if you're 50,000 people? Yeah. You simply need bodies to take casualties and to keep fighting. So 600,000, apparently, was a number that the Jews were able to withstand an attack on all sides and come out triumphant. No, it's interesting about the restrictions. It's something that we cannot, but also can imagine these days because we travel freely up until the pandemic, of course. Mm-hmm. It's interesting about the pandemic because I'm in the middle of making my Ali. I'm, I'm during the I'm middle of the process of the whole application. You can travel freely now, so especially you can't travel. not to Israel. It's like this little taste of what it means that when not things are locked down. Not to be able to go. You, you want to leave, but you can't you're leave. You're not going anywhere. You go want, cry, scream, bang on walls, call the consulate, yell and scream. No one to talk to. Nothing. Bureaucracies. And and imagine if you're living in a place like Odessa <laughs> or, you know, and there's revolution going on around you and there's war and there's civil war and there's, there's fighting. There's travel. There's no communication. There's nothing. No one to talk to. You. And, and then British say, no, you can't go. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting insight. And we're just experiencing it now for the first time probably... 50 60 80 years who knows and it's still relatively comfortable here our lives here yeah but it's it's an uncomfortable feeling not to be able to go because it's spoken about so much on the when the topic of israel comes up or moving to israel and any anything in that genre you always have these these conversations of this concept that you could get up and go to israel on the airplane now and like the airplanes like the eagle and all these like cute ideas and, and there are even rabbis and different authorities who try to give you the impression that, like, there's this concept that if you can't go, you can't go. And it was never, it was never tangible. That, that idea never really had any substance to it until the pandemic, 2020. What it means that something shut down. You can picture it a little bit. You can be Jewish, not Jewish. It doesn't matter. If you're not getting that paper, that visa, that entry, that's already if there are planes flying. You're not going anywhere. There are groups to lobby now, the Israeli government, saying that any Jew should be... Why do you have to be an Israeli citizen? Officially, it's there for every Jew. The land is there for every Jew to come. Any Jew (laughs) normally can come. They're lobbying, what, for uh, visitation? The Israeli government to be... Any Jew should be able to come to Israel. For visitation, that's rough. But such such interesting concepts. Even in our modern times, so comfortable. It's amazing, yeah. yeah. You think you could just get back suddenly, it's like 1928 again. Yeah. Yeah, really fascinating. Well, yeah, I think that wraps it up for this. Yeah, so, you know, from my perspective, it seems like there was a lot of layers to this one, obviously. Yeah. Obviously, the the religious circle was a little simpler because less players and also less going on because it's just ideology, right? They're not doing so much. Correct. Religious Jews are not doing so much. It's just I I support it. I don't. I love it. I don't. I'll write a little... uh, thing on it or i don't and then the followers behind them because the followers trust yeah. the leaders and if the leaders are on board they're on board if they're if they're against it they're against it it's simpler in a way but with these players and mixing in politics it's it be- so becomes complex really hard. so many layers to it so but really interesting nonetheless and it seems like overall majority regardless of if it's for socialism or for safety secular zionists are in israel because of practical reasons. It's obviously not so much Torah ideology, Bible ideology, or God ideology, or any of our values. Right. It's really not rooted in that. It's just practical on one level or another for them or for their parents or grandparents, whoever whoever actually migrated over. Yeah. That leaves what on the topic? That leaves, I suppose, real modern history, which encapsulates the... Palestinian and Israeli conflict, and yes. maybe maybe we'll cover that in the next one. How about American Jewry? Where do they fit in regards to Zionism? In terms of a couple uh, million American Jews, what do they feel about it? Well, 
Oh, you mean the American Jews that are not making Aliyah or not the religious ones? How do they feel about Israel? The secular ones. Secular American Jews. Right. That is kind of like a like a whole nether circle of people. Yeah. Because I, I would say religious Jews, even in America... Still feel the same way as religious, religious right. Jews. They fall into that second episode. Where even if described... they won't pick up and run to Israel, they'll visit, they go, they believe in, right. in, in, in Jews being in Israel and, you know... So in terms of ideology, yeah, so I, I suppose we do have another circle. So maybe in, in part four, we'll we'll cover them and then talk more from a historical standpoint about the conflict now. And that would kind of wrap up this series. Excellent. I'm good with that. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yep.